Welcome, friends. You're listening to the Repro Film Podcast. I'm your host, Asha Dyer. Absolutely jazzed to be back in the hot seat with you all. This month, we are featuring a super sweet short film called How Not to Date While Trans from filmmaker Nyla Moon. You can watch the film over at reprofilm.org during this month, and I guarantee you will love it as much as we did. But before we get into the interview with Nyla, let's talk about the fact that it is no secret there are many transphobic sentiments and statements and people that often go unchecked on social media and even in mainstream media and entertainment. According to GLAAD, a nonprofit organization focused on LGBTQ advocacy and cultural change through storytelling and media narratives, over 70% of people believe that they've never met a trans person. Now, GLAAD uses this statistic to illustrate the importance of what we see in culture and the impact it can have. Talking about this statistic in a presentation at a college recently, award-winning trans journalist, authoress, and podcast host Travel Anderson put it into context, saying, this means that over 70% of people are learning about trans people through what they watch on TV, what they read in the media, and what they see on their timelines on social media. So what does this mean and why does it matter? Well, when it comes to the way trans people are portrayed in media and entertainment, we certainly come a long way, but we also have a long way to go. If we ever hope to see the elimination of transphobic narratives, headlines, and especially political and cultural actions, the film industry could do much better in terms of the scope of trans experiences we see on screen, and it begins with making space for trans creators, storytellers, executives, and decision makers. Right now, audiences can watch Pose on FX, a groundbreaking show centering trans characters that never would have made it to mainstream TV 10 or even five years ago. I personally have been enjoying watching Michaela Rodriguez as Sophia on Apple TV's hilarious series Loot, and of course, the brilliant Nava Mao as Terry on the Netflix hit series Baby Reindeer. Now, what's striking about both Michaela and Nava's characters is that they are both portrayed in romantic relationships, and this is something we don't see often enough. In this month's featured film, Nyla Moon not only wrote and directed How Not to Date While Trans, she also stars as the main character, drawing on some of her own real-life dating experiences in New York City, where she is based. How Not to Date While Trans is a break-the-fourth-wall dark comedy that follows the dating life of a black trans woman and the problematic men she meets along the way. Andy searches for romance and self-love, but ends with heartbreak. We'll do that bit again. Andy searches for romance and self-love, but ends with heartbreak. This film has won multiple awards at numerous film festivals in the US and Canada so far. I guess this means that audiences are hungry for more stories about trans people that are not just a trope, a stereotype, or disempowering. What Nyla and a number of other trans filmmakers are doing is showing the industry that when trans creators, especially trans women of colour, are given the space to create and showcase their own lived experiences, we see a more nuanced, complex, normal and human portrayal that is too often missing from the mainstream. I truly hope you all take the time to watch this great film and enjoy this conversation with Nyla and myself, where we talk about her fave rom-coms, the things she is altogether tired of seeing when it comes to trans folks in film and TV, the impact her film is already having on audiences, and what gives her hope about the future of trans storytelling. Take a listen. Nyla Moon, welcome to the Repro Film Podcast. It's so lovely to be speaking with you today. Thank you for sharing this space with me. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to have this conversation. Yes, and we all love this film. It was so sweet. It was so impactful. And it just kind of gives us a glimpse into a life and experience that often isn't portrayed in film. So I'm really excited to chat about this film with you and share it with our audiences. But first, let's talk about when you began filming How Not to Date While Trans and tell me the process of making it and filming it. How long did it take? Where did you film it? All of the good stuff. I started filming it, was it 20, I think it was 22. 
beginning of 22 or end of 21, it was pretty easy. So I was a part of a, a writing fellowship, the Hillman grad writing fellowship. And I was like writing a drama and it was like a kind of a dark, heavy drama. And so I wanted to write something lighter because I, I applied into the program with a comedy, but they, they put me in the drama track, which is cool. So I, I started writing um, How Not to Date because of like what was going on in, in like the public, you know, the conversation about trans dating, the date child thing that was happening. I, I already kind of had it like in the barrel. So like when it came to production, it was pretty quick. Like I, I just got my friends together who were all filmmakers. Like we went to school together and I showed them the script and I was just like, let's do it. So we filmed it in Brooklyn and it took about five days to film. Oh, that's so fun. Yeah, I gave myself a little time to like nail it. <laughs> and for people who aren't familiar with Hillman, it's a film school in New York, correct? Oh, so Hillman grad is a writing fellowship by, writing fellowship. Okay. yeah, by the, the screenwriter, um, Lena Waif. She has like a, she started a program to like, to like level up like actors and writers and teach them television writing and acting on screen. And I was a part of the inaugural class of it. So that was really exciting. I met like a lot of cool people. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love Lena Waithe. I'm so glad that we get to I feel like we're two degrees away from Lena Waits right now with you, Nyla. So this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and for people who also aren't familiar with, I know we're going to kind of get into, um, you know, the narratives around trans dating. And, but for people who aren't familiar with the Dave Chappelle thing, can you kind of just um, summarize it in a nutshell so people know, you know, what has been going on? Yeah, Dave Chappelle had a comedy special when everything started opening up after quarantine, the pandemic in 21 he he basically was sh taking shots at the trans community and particularly surrounding like you know like how we show up in the world and like the validity of like us going to the bathrooms and it was like a huge mess it was it started kind of like a netflix walkout where like trans people at netflix they kind of walked out because you know he was like horribly transphobic and slightly misinformed and usually when something like this happens, like online, like before it became X on Black Twitter, people were talking about like, like in the Black community about like trans people and, and relationships and romance. And it always kind of devolves to the conversation about if you met a trans woman and she didn't tell you, what would you do? And when we kind of talk about trans people in our lives, it's always framed, you know, like how we just kind of come into people's lives and then like what how what do people do to handle us in their lives versus like what are our actual lives like and our actual experiences so I really wanted to and specifically with dating I really wanted to write something that was like definitely from our point of view or I mean at least my point of view and hopefully I mean I'm happy a lot of trans people also connected to the story and related to the story too so I really wanted to like hey, you know, you guys are not asking us. You're like making assumptions about our experience. You know, in these narratives, there's just like a distinct dehumanization because they're not inviting trans folks to the table for the conversation. So I love what you've been doing and with this film and, and speaking out as well on social media. I, I think that's really incredible. So, well, let's talk about how not to date while trans. I, I think one of the things I love about the film is that you playing Andy, talk directly to the audience. You're kind of breaking that fourth wall. She's narrating her journey while also acting out in the scenes with the dates that she goes on. Why did you make this creative choice and why was it important to kind of speak to the audience directly as well as the characters in the film? You know, a lot of people do have like negative opinions about trans people, but I think it comes from not knowing trans people I think it's just a, a general bad misconception from lack of like knowing a trans person personally in your life. So I really wanted to use the element of breaking the fourth wall because I wanted the audience to be in on it with the character. And I wanted the character of Andy to be your trans best friend, kind of like similar to like Phoebe Waller-Bridgers did in Fleabag and also sort of... Um, and she's got to have it and on um, Ferris Bueller's day off like you're you're when like a character breaks the fourth wall you're you're in on the joke with them you know you're navigating the journey with them so I I thought that that approach to telling a trans story would like 
kind of like elicit a little more empathy in the experience based on my personal experience. Cause like, I would like work with like cishet guys who, you know, like a normal cishet guy's opinion about trans women. And then we work together and we become friends. And then they're just like, you know, they're in it with me. They're just like, oh my God, that guy's horrible. You can do better. And I think that like, that was really important to do, you know, because a lot of times in trans stories, especially when they're not by like trans filmmakers, it's really like objective, you know, like we're, we are away from the character as they're experiencing life. Of course, we're watching them and, you know, in, in filmmaking, it allows you to get closer. But I think like, for, for trans rights to like really be and people to have empathy for trans people, I think we need to get a little more subjective, you know? Have that personal connection. Yeah. Oh, that's so fascinating. I, I always love hearing why filmmakers make certain creative choices and every answer I, I hear is just always so fascinating and enlightening. So I think there's like an, an activist element to it, but also it's very creative. And and that's something I didn't even realise that it, it is about drawing in the audience like, you're in on this with me. So that's, yeah, that's really cool. I love that. It also felt like such a lighthearted, mostly, you know, and friendly in tone of looking into one trans woman's dating experience because so not every dating experience is alike. It's not a monolith. Mm -hmm. Was the tone intentional? Like was it important to you to have this kind of lighthearted, joyful, funny at times tone? And if so, why did you choose to have this direction? I wanted it to to start off with a, being lighthearted because I I mean I grew up with romantic comedies I love a great romantic comedy do you have a fave I do I mean okay I don't know if this is technically a romantic comedy I guess it is but okay <laughs> this is a hot take but I love How to Lose a Guy in Ten Days I know it doesn't hold up. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, the other one that I really, really love absolutely, and <laughs> I'm probably going to get filleted for this, but it's okay, you know, and it does hold up, but I love Legally Blonde. So hey, that much. is a great classic. That graduation speech, sometimes I like watch videos replaying it because I'm just like, oh, well, she was, you know, I wanted it to have like that like fun element in the beginning, you know, to really, I mean... Honestly, it's like the medicine and sugar method, you know, because it really like eases people in, you know, sometimes, you know, unfortunately, which it shouldn't be like this, but if it starts out like a little harder, or grittier, or like in your face, people are just like, ah, oh, my sensibilities. So I, <laughs> so I really wanted to, to like, to lead in really, really like light and fun. And I, and I think too, like, in cinema history, there's not like a, a, a lot of examples of like light trans experiences, you know, like they're kind of like a little tragic how we're portrayed in TV. And like, I know for me, like, you know, I grew up in the, um, in the aughts and then, you know, I was in my, I was in my twenties in the 2010s. So I was just like, oh my God, I was watching like Jerry Springer and Law and & Order. And I was like, oh my God, I'm getting murdered in a bathroom stall. I really wanted to kind of shift that dynamic and like make it a little fun, you know, and also too, for like trans people who are coming up to find it. Like I, I love now when I get messages from trans children or trans young adults who, who love the character of Andy. And I really wanted to give them that person who was kind of similar to like, you know, the romantic leads of like nineties and in the, in the aughts. But like make it really specific because we we don't like again, we don't have like black trans characters like this. And I want to show them that, you know, because like, I mean, I've had like struggles being a trans person, but it was, you know, I'm like, it was pretty fun. You know, I've had a good time. So I wanted to like put that online in media and show that. Yeah, I think that's so wonderful. And we need to do that because there is so much heaviness out there. And like you're saying, what's happening with these bathroom bills and the discourse around trans folks it's we want to it's it's important to see that representation of joy and fun and nuance as well so I want to know how much of your real life experiences did you draw upon to write the script was it 100% autobiographical or was there some fictional aspects and also what was it like you know casting yourself to play the lead character a lot of it was based on my experience. The park scene did happen to me, funny enough, like where the guy like runs away from. In the park, really? That, that did happen to me. 
but it I mean it did it kind of had like a similar well not a great ending it had like a a neutral ending where after the guy ran away he like called me a week later and he was like let's meet up <laughs> you know sometimes you gotta give you gotta give stuff time to cook I like acting a lot and um I started off before filmmaking, I was taking um, this like LGBT acting class in the city. And I mean, it's kind of a little infamous now, but like, it was like where all the trans actors went, you know, to like learn acting. Really what pushed me towards filmmaking, because I was taking it in my undergrad, I was like taking classes at this studio. And what pushed me to filmmaking is like, you know, when I would like read the breakdowns and I would like see what was out there, it wasn't anything I really wanted to play. So I was just like, I can't continue to like allow other people to like create the stories that I want to be in. You know, I like, I mean, and this was like a before pose, you know, came out and pose is so amazing, but this was like before pose. So like every, every like role for trans characters were like dead hooker 87 and law and order SVU. I really wanted to like push it a little further and, and like create more like modern like stories for trans people. So that's kind of what like led me into filmmaking a little bit. And, and I was just like, I'm gonna cast myself because you know, I'm a filmmaker. (laughs) And you did such a great job. You're so electric and engaging. You know, you can't take your eyes off Andy slash you. I mean, you're so funny and inviting. It's like, I want to see an hour long film about this. I want to see more of you. So I hope that you will continue to pursue both filmmaking and acting because we need to see you on screen too, girl, just saying. Thank you. <laughs> well, speaking of the, you know, the mainstream TV, you mentioned The Law and Orders and The Dead Hooker 80, number 87 and, you know, these very, like, not so great portrayals. We definitely don't see enough trans dating experiences reflected in mainstream TV. I feel like the most recent high-profile example I can think of is Terry in Baby Reindeer on Netflix. Mm-hmm. And she's wonderful. But it also feels significant that your film focuses on dating as a trans woman of color. Let's talk about more about why this is important for audiences to see, you know, not just the hopeful and joyful and everyday examples, but also why we need to see trans women of color in situations that are affirming and and lighthearted as well. The statistics for violence against trans women, and particularly black trans women of color are like atrocious. And unfortunately, you know, like a lot of people think you know like when you're trans that's the main like you know sticking point but like Kimberly Crenshaw who I love and when I read about intersectionality it blew my mind I was just like oh yeah this is what I'm experiencing so I really want to like you know like show like more of all stories about black trans women because there is like an intersectional experience being like a black trans woman that like I don't think people like necessarily think about you know a lot like because people are just like your biggest struggle is being trans you know but there's also you know being a trans woman being like a fat trans woman being a trans woman with kinky hair being you know like a disabled trans woman so I really wanted to kind of like push against that and like and I'm trying to do even more now with my future work really like interwove my culture in like my work as a trans woman because like it's 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 a different experience. I mean, this is really like shady, but like back in the day, like with black trans girls, they would tell us that we needed to get our noses done. You know, they would be like, you need to get your nose done. You need to straighten your hair. You need to like, you need to like fit this like aesthetic that is like more palatable, which is an experience that black women experience too. But like a lot of times, like, you know, trans women are kind of left out of the conversation of that a little bit. So I thought it would be great to like, you know, like have that representation there. And I mean, I like, of course, I want to work with all trans people, but like, there's just so much like space, like there's so much work that needs to be, that needs to like happen to like in the Black trans community and visibility terms, because like the violence, you know, is heavily prevalent with like Black trans women even to the point, like, you know, I grew up in New York City and, like, a lot of, like, the, like, white Latina or indigenous Latina girls will kind of, like, you know, they could pump through. But if you were a Black trans girl, violence, you know, like, you had to fight to get through because people, people would just be, like, it's kind of weird, but it's, like, you know, Black women, like, people, like, like to masculinize Black women. So for Black trans women, that's, like, 
hyper. Like you're just like, you're like double a man if you're a black trans woman. So I really wanted to like shift that a little bit and kind of like, you know, like do a little bit what Issa Rae did with like awkward black, I mean, the awkward black girl insecure kind of narrative where it kind of like shift the conversation of like, there's no singular black experience, you know? And I kind of want to do that with trans women, black trans women. It's super important. I mean, just this idea of disrupting what people think of as the status quo or like the monolith of a certain group of people. It's like everyone's an individual. Everyone has their own experiences. And like you're talking about with Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined the term intersectionality, we all occupy so many multiple different spaces. You know, it's whether it's your gender and your race and your financial status or your zip code and your culture, I mean, so your age, so many different things, your abilities or disabilities. It's just so important to have those nuanced stories and have people be afforded the space to share their stories, especially on film, which can be so impactful, um, like what you're doing. So I think that's really important. And, you know, speaking of the film industry, it's hard to break into the film industry for Everyone except cishet white guys, I guess. I mean, I know it's hard for them too, but listen, it's a tough industry to break into. So much has been changing. We've had writer strikes and actor strikes and AI and just streaming platforms exploding and it can be really, really hard. So tell me, Nyla, as a trans filmmaker, can you tell me about your journey to getting where you are today and tell me about some of the barriers you've navigated along the way as well? I faced like a lot of similar barriers. I don't think my like experience is as unique, but I think like it kind of started in grad school. Um, I went to city college in the city and um, in New York city, I'm saying the city, like New York is the, that's a, that's a really New Yorker thing to do. I'm sorry. <laughs> and so when I like, because I had taken the trans acting class and then I think it was like a year after my undergrad. And then I applied for a graduate program and so by then I was like gung ho. I'm like, I only want to tell trans stories. And so when I got there, like there was like kind of a lot of, I mean, uh, it was kind of like, it was, it was a little shade towards like the, the stories I wanted to tell. Like people were kind of just like, what a trans person being in love, you know, like, and particularly what I've faced a lot is like, And I don't think of myself as like an innovator, but I think that the stuff I want to do, like people haven't, haven't seen it before. And I think in Hollywood, it's a hard sell, especially now we're like in this point where we're just like IP is king, you know, it's a really a hard sell or get people to like champion like trans stories and particularly the way that I want to tell them because like a lot we haven't seen that before you know like even pose like I love pose to death you know pose is a great show but like how not to date and pose are really different and I think that like specifically now in terms of like visibility the industry is really scared to take a risk with those stories so that's kind of the problem that I'm like or not the problem that's like my challenge you know that I'm working towards like is like pushing against that because a lot of times, you know, like I'll have meetings and, you know, people will love how not to date. They'll love the story, but you know, like it, they're risk adverse sometimes to like, you know, like moving forward with it or, 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 or like, you know, like actually de- shaking it up and decentering, you know, like what the general perspective is about like a community. And I think that's, that's kind of like, like what I'm going with now, because like, I feel like personally, you know, like, because there's so little, I feel like if I don't make stories about trans people as a filmmaker, as an artist, I'm doing a disservice to like the kid in me. I'm doing a disservice to like the future generation. So that like really like narrows me into like a really specific niche, which I definitely understand. But I I know that like the work is like, it's good work, you know, the work is needed. So I, I fully accept that and I totally understand it, but I'm like, I always tell myself to like focus on the work, you know, focus on making the thing and like let whatever happens happens, you know, but I mean, I guess that's the only thing that can keep me sane in the industry, you know, because it's always so it's really just hard to like get things made, you know, and for people to take chances on things 
I mean, I'm always like, you know, I need to take a chance on myself first, you know, before I expect other people to take a chance on me. I think that's good advice for all filmmakers who are in a similar situation where they they don't see the stories that they want to occupy on screen. So how do you keep going and finding a way forward? So I think that's really great advice and good encouragement for filmmakers and artists because it is hard and it is a very cis-hetero industry, generally speaking, um, and still very white, although it is changing, but mm -hmm. it is a very risk-adverse industry. So right now while we have the opportunities, it's like take them. Yeah. When I did Hillman, which was a great opportunity, I was given some advice that I need to like focus on strengthening myself as a screenwriter before I moved on to directing. And I did not take that advice, but I think that like what happens a lot of times in this industry, you know, a lot of people will have a great concept and they will write it and then they'll be trying to like get money to get it made. And of course, you know, like I understand that my films, you know, like are kind of easy to be made, you know, cause they're like a little lower budget. And I'm like, I'm, I'm used to being broke. So I'm used to working with them. <laughs> I always tell like people who are filmmakers, I'm like, you know, like try to make the thing, you know, like don't, cause you don't want to be stuck, like just having like the script, which is a really important thing, you know, like try yeah. making it, try making something because that like feeds your artistic practice despite what anyone may say about your work, you know, or even if people are interested in it, just continue making things, you know, and that that will like keep you going. As long as it makes you proud, the the younger you proud and the future you proud and the present you proud, I think that that's the number one audience for any filmmaker when they're starting out or, or further along in their career. It's like you have to love what you do because if you don't, you can't just rely on other people for validation. So I'm not speaking to myself to like to take this advice on board, Asha. <laughs> we <Hey>. all have to. <laughs> it's like it's easy to say it, but how do I live it too? So note to self. Well, in a political and cultural climate where we are seeing so much aggressive pushback on trans rights, especially for youth, youth athletes in schools. And you know, here at Repro Film, we're really trying to focus this year on the idea of divorcing or dismantling capitalism from bodily autonomy like how do we create space for our bodily autonomy in all different ways and honor ourselves and each other in this repro film space so can you draw some connection between seeing positive affirming and entertaining trans characters in storylines and films and the potential impact it can have on culture at large and you know if there are any examples you can think of politically or culturally that you really see are uh, important to push back. Feel free to mention those. But yeah, what are the connections between film and culture and how they impact each other? I was watching this documentary and it was by Kamal Bell and it was it was called We Need to Talk About Bill Cosby. Oh yes, yeah. It was it was an amazing documentary. But what really was interesting to me about it or what really stuck with me in terms of like being a filmmaker is that how like stuff can really change culture and I always thought like when I watched the Cosby show I thought it was actually airy when I was watching it but turns out I was like watching reruns because I thought it was like you know it, it came out in the 90s but it didn't so it gave like a slight history of like the Cosby show and it talked about how like kind of like one of the first shows that showed like a black family that wasn't necessarily like the Jeffersons it was just a black family like living life and of course like you know the the Huxfields were like upper middle class but it really like shifted how how like America saw like the black mm -hmm. family so I think I think like that's like the mission you know for like minority filmmakers is to keep making the things because eventually you know it is going to it is going to shift. It is going to, it is going to, it is going to be a turning point, a tipping point. And I think like, even now, all of like the anti-trans legislation and the restrictions on trans people. And the reality is, you know, like, even though they're not saying it, but like, they want to like legislate us out of existence currently. That is the reality of what, where we're, where we're at. But I think the beautiful part of it is that like, they can never legislate us away, you know? And like, that's why it's still really important to like have like 
work, this work out there so people can see. And I think outside of like, you know, like mainstream traditional cinema. And that's why I think like now in terms of like trans um, filmmaking, like we're kind of like in a trans renaissance, you know, where like there are so many like amazing like trans filmmakers out there making like amazing work. And that that's going to live on despite like, you know, like how like fraught our political climate is. And that is important. You know, that is like, this is our, essentially our like Harlem Renaissance. I go to film festivals and I see so, so much important work. It isn't talked about in the news and it isn't like highlighted, like let's say at the bigger festivals, but it's still there. And that is like the, because I don't like to think of myself as an activist because I'm like, you know, there's so many people who are better orators out there, you know, than me. But I do think like my work is kind of like my activism. So I think creating this work and having it out there is what will live on forever, you know, because eventually like this is as old as time, you know, like there's pushback against a certain group of people. It gets really dark, you know, And then eventually it shifts. And the beauty of it now is like, you know, we're in this darkness. And when it shifts, we'll still have our work that will carry on. That's the beautiful. I mean, I'm like, I'm like, I'm I'm an optimistic person. (laughs) I love that. I think that's really wonderful. And I feel like hope is contagious. And it's just so beautiful the way you, you put that because the work will live on. And aside from yourself, can you tell us about other trans filmmakers that we should be paying attention to and, and who you are? inspired by right now nava mao the actress terry from baby reindeer she is a phenomenal filmmaker oh i didn't know she was a filmmaker yeah she's a director she has um i forgot the name of it oh my god it's a new it's on her imdb page because i i saw it and then i looked it up and it is an amazingly beautiful trans drama ariel Mahler, which is a dear friend of mine they live in la they are doing really important documentaries and also on narrative projects. Olivia Peace, they won the Student Academy Award on like two years ago, I think, for their virtual reality piece called Against Reality. Wow. What do you want audiences to love most about How Not to Date While Trans? And what are the main messages or message you hope sticks with people? What I would really love for people to kind of get from it is it's not as like black and white as they think, because when a lot of people approach the conversation of like trans people dating, they're kind of just like, you need to reveal as soon as you meet them right away that you're trans. And it doesn't matter if you're romantically interested in them or not. If they're romantically interested in you, you need to tell them that you're trans. And, and from How Not to Date, what I want to show is that like, you know, like trans people are human and we are navigating this complicated human experience like everyone else. So like go a little easy on us in the dating and the dating scene, you know, and also, you know, like if you're a trans, you know, amorous person, you know, like be open about your love of trans people because it also like, you know, like trans people, we can't do the just do the work ourselves you know we need like our allies and people who are love who love us and who are romantically interested in us to like be loud and proud about that because like this is kind of a naughty fact but like trans porn is really popular so like where are those people at you know <laughs> like be out and visible too because you know it it does help and it does like shift the conversation because a lot of, you know, the trans violence is linked to intimate partner violence. Of course, there is violence, you know, that trans people experience when they're just like living their daily life. But like a lot of the violence that trans women experience, it's because of intimate partner violence. Hopefully people see this film and particularly like, you know, like cishet men, hopefully it teaches them to like love trans people openly and be and be more proud of that. Because we all deserve love. Yes. And I think one of the things I got as an audience member, if it's okay to share, is that we have to be responsible for investigating and interrogating our own opinions and perspectives. Like, why do we feel uncomfortable? Why do we feel a certain way? I think that's something I'm always trying to do in my life, generally being accountable for myself. But I think that's something that maybe cishet man watching this could do, you know, or anyone watching, like, why do we have these certain perspectives? Why do we hold these opinions? What are we listening to in the media? What are we reading online? And how do we kind of shift that discourse and see it from 
an actual trans person's perspective rather than a podcast bro, for instance. Yeah, totally. Because like, we're going to be here, even though people like to like to speak against this, you know, like, especially shout out to like my East African trans people. There are like a lot of horrible laws that are happening to legislate, you know, out of existence. But the reality is you can't legislate us because like trans people have been a part of every culture in the world we're always going to be here so you should you should like get used to us and learn to like love us well said as a trans woman of color and a filmmaker having an impact can you tell me two things what are you most tired of what are you most hopeful about I'm kind of tired of like and this is definitely has informed my work so much but I'm like so tired of like the trans or or LGBT best friend trope and and like media like like we're I I understand we're really magical people <laughs> and you know like everyone wants to be our best friends but like I kind of wish that would die a little bit and I'm hopeful for like the future of like of the art you know because there's so much like great work there's so many great trans artists so many great like queer musicians out there pushing it further. So I'm really hopeful to see like where we'll be in the next five years, the next 10 years, like regardless like of, of like the laws that are happening like globally to like oppress trans people, there's still like being art made and there's like still stories being told because I feel like with my generation, you know, there has been like, there was like a little moment where, you know, like in the eighties and nineties, it was kind of like really rough to be trans. And then there was like a shift when like in the aughts and early 2010s where it was like a, they eased up on us a little bit and now like now we can't like be stopped you know now we're just like oh I can be a filmmaker or I can be a writer or I can you know I can be a musician and that little ease up created this like explosion of like hyper visibility and hyper like awareness of us so I'm, I'm excited to see where we go because like we we're absolutely in like a transcultural renaissance right now so like it's just like exciting to see what's next and and also to be a part of that too I'm glad to be witnessing the trans renaissance right now and to be featuring it on repro film is really special for us too so Nyla Moon what are you working on next and where can our listeners follow you and check out all the work that you're doing. So you can follow me at Nyla Moon and Nyla Moon Films. I'm really basic on social media, so forgive me. <laughs> it's hard to be an influencer and be an artist. So the people who are able to do it, I'm like, how are y'all able to do that and write scripts and edit and do the actual art and do the social media? If you have any advice, DM me. So you can follow me on Instagram. I'm there a lot. Currently, I just got done shooting a feature film, and I'm really excited about it. It's called I Used to Be a Woman, But I Gave It All Up for Christ. And it's like a mockumentary kind of poking fun at the fundamental Christian ex-gay community. Kind of like The Office what we do in the shadows oh my god I can't wait to see this yeah it's it's going pretty well so hopefully I want to premiere it in the fall so hopefully if everything goes according to plan I'm gonna like it'll be out and people can see it at festivals so I'm like trying to like get that together well please keep us posted and we'll definitely post about it and champion it and I'm really fascinated to see your take on this and see a, a narrative flip in that realm and many people will be excited to see this so keep us posted and we will be showing how not to date while trans during this month on reprofilm.org nyla moon thank you so much for the work you're doing and for sharing this space with me it's been a pleasure chatting with you today thank you so much you can watch How Not to Date Wild Trans over at reprofilm.org right now and be sure to follow Nyla on both her film and personal Instagram accounts, which we have linked to in the show notes today. Be sure to share this podcast episode with a friend and help us spread the Repro Film mission, which is all about centering bodily autonomy through storytelling, film and conversation. The Repro Film podcast is executive produced by Mama Film, hosted and produced by me, Asha Dyer, Edited by Kylie Brown, with original music by Paris Jane and Maurice Anthony. 
The periodical is programmed by Neha Aziz and written by Emily Christensen. You can find us on social media at ReproFilm on Instagram and watch our additional video content on our YouTube channel at ReproFilm.org. I'm your host, Asha Dyer, and I look forward to bringing you our next podcast episode. Bye for now.